really I'm very honored that we have got one of the a leader in the earthquake engineering in the world, I can say freely, and I will start, I just was looking very soon that uh, Professor Michele Hall was cited about 10,500 times, which for the civil engineering is a really impressive uh, citation. And Professor Michele Calvi uh, uh, expressed when I invite him to come, and we are very happy because we have um, uh, now such a uh, known, uh, such a known professor. So, um, so I would like to give a short introduction about Professor Calvi. So Professor Calvi is professor at the University of Pavia in Italy, and he's a judge professor at the uh, North California State University. He received his master, master of Science for the University of California, Be Berkeley, and his PhD for the Polytechnic di, Mila di Milano. And also he has got an honorary doctorate for the University of uh, Chuyo Mendoza, Argentina. He has been founder of the European Foundation of the Rose School. By the way, Rose School is one of the best known uh, schools for uh, educated students from the um, uh, field of um, earthquake engineering. And he has been member of, of a board of directors of a GEM Foundation and is one of the directors of the International Association of uh, Earthquake Engineering. He's uh, author and co-author of hundreds of publications and of two major books. And really these uh, books are practically fundament of a uh, new approach in earthquake engineering. One book is uh, Seismic Design and Retrofitting of Bridges, and the other is Displacement-Based Seismic Design of Structures. He has been designer, consultant, Checker for hundreds of structure, structural projects, including uh, Rion and Trino Cable State Bridge, which is long two kilometers and 8,800 uh, meters in Greece. He was also designer of the Bolo Viaduct in Turkey, and he uh, and a new house system uh, after the earthquake like L'Aquila which was very innovative using base isolation with um, um, 185 buildings were isolated and uh, Professor Michele Calvo implemented about 7,000 uh, different devices. At the end, I would like to stress that practically he is a co-editor of the Journal of Earthquake Engineering, which is uh, published by the Taylor and Francis, and also he is an editor to a to the Italian journal uh, for the practitioners, Seismica, Journal of Italian um, Association. And he has been invited keynote speakers to the number of sport conferences, to the number of European co conferences. And now we are very lucky to have to the uh, opening of uh, our academic uh, year to have the perfect pres presenter, uh, my very good friend, uh, Professor Michele Cavi. So, please. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Michele. Uh, it's been it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I will, uh, following the strict indication of uh, Professor Gareschi, I will give actually two relatively short presentations. One is uh, mainly related to uh, our facilities. Uh, uh, Professor Garesi was keen to learn about our new uh, premises. I am, as he was saying, yeah, with, um, I'm involved uh, in, in a foundation at the University of Pavia, which is probably the, say, the largest laboratory in the world, probably. Largest in the sense that uh, there is uh, the larger number of uh, of uh, experimental tests uh, uh, anywhere uh, in the world. 
Um, I will start with a very the challenge of you sent brief mitigate Please. risk protect Clearing. public values it's okay. It's okay. between chance and necessity it's, we have been playing the game of progress it's between it's a video which has been prepared uh, now keep it the analysis most. and the mitigation of risk has been prepared uh, increasing the sense uh, you more said and more complex Earthquakes, quite landslides, it. floods, uh, accidents, yeah. terrorist attacks, collapses, all undermine the essential condition for the quality of life, for safety. Safety for you center means reliability of buildings and infrastructures in which we live, means identification and assessment of seismic risk, means engineering, and structural experimentation that allows research, innovation, and technology. Means the quality of life and wellness for everybody. In the complex game between statics and dynamics, between hazard and vulnerability, between prediction and prevention, you center works to protect life and its values, and for a more stable and safer world for everybody. You center research and science of safety. So, so you forgive me. I started with a with a clip. I was not speaking myself, but I think that this and uh, very shortly give the reason and the ratio why we have started this adventure about uh, 20 years ago. Uh, but but actually, all the leverages were started in 2005. So it's, uh, it's uh, everything is very recent. The uh, foundation has, uh, has a fundamental goals similar probably to other institutions like ESIS here I mean, in, in development of research and, uh, and uh, to give uh, support to co-development and so on. We have about uh, 110 permanent staff and collaborators and we have uh, uh, a year uh, revenues of about 8 million euros. So there is no money coming from any public institutions, no money coming from the government. It's just research money, so we compete for projects and we, we, we have this level of, uh, of uh, uh, revenues. We have six departments uh, dealing with uh, risk scenarios, industrial products, experimental techniques, construction infrastructures, education and emergency support. I don't want to spend too much time on each one of these, so I will come back to, this, uh, to these subjects. But you can imagine industrial products means, for example, isolation uh, devices, uh, dampers, we are developing new uh, kind of devices, experimental techniques, we are designing uh, ourselves uh, all our own uh, uh, shaping tables or testing rigs, I will show you something later on. And the construction infrastructures means uh, uh, to develop uh, uh, novel ideas on how to strengthen uh, existing buildings or how to design new buildings. And we spend a lot of effort in, in education, particularly for practitioners and and of course also for uh, PhD students, we have about uh, 100 uh, graduate students in, in earthquake engineering. In emergency support, I will go briefly also on this subject. We have several facilities that move around that can be used uh, on, on the premises of, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, earthquakes and, and so on. So uh, for what concerns the laboratories, uh, I don't know if you can read there, but we have uh, Several facilities. One is a is a, a main shake table, one is a freedom about six by seven meters. Very powerful. It could go to seven G. Uh, one meter displacement, two point two meters per second velocity. Um, we have uh, a second lab. He's the rector. Okay, it's a it's a great honor to have you here. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, Professor. It's a great honor. Uh, this is a second shaking table we opened recently. It's a 4.8 by 4.8 meters. Uh, it's uh, now 4 degrees of freedom. It will become 6 in 2 months uh, because we are adding uh, capacities. This is also very powerful. Again, uh, 1 meter displacement capacity in both directions. Uh, just, just to give you a rough figure, and it could go to 6 to 7 Gs in, in both directions. We can control all different axes. And we design everything. Uh, so even even the actuators have been designed and constructed on our on our um, specifications. Uh, we have uh, um, strong floor, strong wall reaction systems with uh, a lot of capacities. The dimension of of the maximum space is about 
uh, 15 by 10 meters in plan and you could, could be about 15 meters tall and we have this uh, testing rig that actually I designed uh, now several years ago and is probably the most demanded of all our facilities is, uh, is a testing rig for isolation devices we can have up to 50,000 kilonewton vertically controlled in dynamic at 0.4 meters per second velocity and uh, having that force, that vertical force capacity we can move horizontally in both directions a shaking table where these this, uh, uh, devices are, are controlled vertically and around the two horizontal axes and we can move them horizontally so this is, uh, we do about uh, 200 uh, uh, tests per year on this, uh, on this machine and, and specimens are coming really from all over the world from Korea, from Taiwan, from everywhere to, to use this um, we have also a damper tester, uh, which is used for uh, damper elements used in, in earthquake uh, protect construction. Uh, they could be as long as eight meters, and uh, and the, again the power is, is is very high. I will not spend time, but we have a lot of innovative uh, uh, systems for data capturing. Uh, we do almost everything now using optical uh, evaluation. So that's uh, that's one 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 optical reflector, so it's, it's just passive, but we use uh, high resolution cameras that could, could take uh, enough data to uh, take all the indications. This is one, one of our last uh, facilities, I designed it last year, is uh, is a movable laboratory, uh, it's, it's a truck essentially, but this movable laboratory uh, could, uh, could uh, produce a, a flow, an, an oil flow of 6,000 liters per minute. So is, this is more powerful than most laboratories of universities all over the world. And this can be taken anywhere. Of course, uh, to move this, uh, we move also other three trucks. One is to have electricity power, so it's a power generator of uh, one megawatt, and the other for data acquisition and so on. This facility, uh, just uh, this uh, weekend, on Friday and Saturday, was uh, in Milano at the Museum of Science, Leonardo da Vinci, because there was the night of researchers and approximately 1,200 people were allowed to go on a movable shaking table that we have been taken there. This movable shaking table is 5 meters by 2.5 meters, was alimented by this, and we allowed uh, uh, normal people to feel the uh, earthquake under their feet uh, in, in, in a bi-directional shaking table. Uh, Okay, this, this is the mobile unit for structural assessment and this was when I uh, designed a few months ago the movable shaking table. It's 2.5 by 5 because when, it's, uh, when it moves, it's rotated in this way on the track, so it's 2.5 meters wide and it go, can go on a normal street. When we arrive where we want to use it, it's rotated 90 degrees and the actuators are located in this, in this position, the actuators are normally in the other track and, and we could use this anywhere, essentially. With, we have been given too much power to, to move this. We have many ongoing research projects, I don't want to spend time on this, uh, I want to go to the, to the uh, final part in five minutes of this, of this part of the presentation. But just, just to make more clear, when I'm talking about uh, seismic risk assessment, assessment of structure and infrastructure, I mean that we have uh, databases for the National System of Civil Protection, we have some uh, 50,000 schools in the database, 20,000 uh, bridges, all the port structures, all the airport, uh, and so on. All the, uh, let me see, yeah, airports and bridges, uh, I, I talk about bridges and so on. And uh, we have cloud services post -event for post-event damage and risk evaluation. This is uh, just an example, uh, but I will not stay for the, for, for the entire presentation. Let me try to go faster. After an earthquake, we go with this. Uh, I'm sorry for the writing system. We use we use drones, drones to, to go around and to enter places where it's dangerous to enter. And through satellite communication, all the information is sent to our laboratories where we elaborate them, and we have this continuous uh, correlation between the people in the field and 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 our and our laboratory. But uh, let me go ahead. Uh, this is just uh, this is the main uh, one degree of freedom shaking table. Just to give you examples of the four stories uh, full scale uh, uh, buildings that have been tested uh, in, in the last years on, on that shaking table. And uh, uh, this is 
inside the testing rig for, uh, for base isolation devices. You can see this is a double surface base isolation devices and this is a camera inside the rig. Uh, on this device there is probably several thousand tons uh, uh, vertically. Um, okay, we are working a lot on, on induced seismicity, but again, I don't want to spend time on this. But for example, uh, what you can see here is the construction of, of an Esri house that is a faithful replica of a house in northern uh, Netherlands, uh, where they have big problems of induced seismicity because of gas extraction. And, and this has been constructed by uh, Dutch masons on, on one of the shaking table. Now I'll try to And you see, this is the construction. And finally, uh, this is how the house looks like. And I can show you just one, one test. Look up there. Well, you see, and, and this is a very short duration of earthquake because induced seismicity is typically, it's just a short duration. It's just a probably four, five, six seconds uh, duration of, 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 of the shake of the, and it's a, a strong spike. So this is the kind of, uh, of simulation that we do. Uh, uh, this uh, is now existing, this new lab. The only reason why I'm, uh, I'm showing this is because uh, um, it's uh, particularly for people who are not so used. Okay, you can see how this was conceived. So this is the six degrees of freedom shaking table. The shaking table slides on the four uh, pancake actuators and uh, the other two long ones are springs. So the, the red pancakes actuator are put under pressure. So they only work in one direction but it, they, they go in more or less pressure, and they are compressed by the two long spring that can take the angle of the, of, the isolate, of, the, of the movement of the table. And this is the kind of movement of the table that already presently is doing with these two green actuators that you see there. So uh, you, you will see in a minute, but uh, in, before Christmas, we are going to substitute the two green actuators that were put there because we had them already available, and uh, uh, what, what will happen uh, is this. Okay, you see, okay, uh, the, the, the two actuators will be replaced, replaced by four actuators, so now the actuators can move the table in this direction, but they can also move the table in the other direction and they can go around the yaw movement, around the, the rotation around the vertical axis, and all the rest will remain uh, as it is. But on this table we have also designed, actually I have also designed another facility that I will describe uh, later on in, in a few minutes. So this is just to show you... Uh, okay, oh, I'm sorry. This is a very simple specimen, but just, just to show this is part of a nuclear power plant. You know that you have to test, probably you do it, uh, this kind of test here too. And uh, you have to test each single uh, component. And uh, uh, this is just uh, an example. You can see that the table is moving in, in, in the four degrees of freedom that are presently possible. I was talking about this new facility that uh, just finished uh, designing, and this is something like this. So there will be another shaking table on top of the existing shaking table with an independent reaction system and with uh, four um, vertical connectors with uh, inches top and bottom. So the upper shaking table will move vertically with the lower one. And also the two rotation and the two horizontal axis will be the same as the lower one. But the upper one will be moved by four independent, very long stroke actuators. Very long means two meter uh, displacement capacity. And the two horizontal displacement and the yaw will be independent. So this system will have nine degrees of freedom. And the purpose of this is to be able to test, to simulate the response of any two stories at any height of a building with uh, uh, any sort of connection with uh, glass facades, uh, elevators, uh, rather than uh, pipelines or um, stairways or whatever, just to have, let's say, the, the response of non-structure elements when a certain uh, level of uh, floor acceleration and relative uh, uh, interstory drift 
are imposed. This is something that does not exist anywhere, and uh, it could be a challenge also from the point of view of electronics and control, because to control nine degrees of freedom at the same time is not that easy. Um, I, I'm not sure whether I have a movie here. No. Okay. Just, just, just to, to tell you a few words about the uh, movable track that I show you is something like this, and the idea came to my mind when, <clears throat> after the L'Aquila earthquake that uh, Professor Gresky was mentioned. I designed a system to test entire buildings, shake entire buildings using actuators. And I did uh, 15 buildings. You can see here on top of this there is an entire building. And this is an actuator, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's an isolation device, you see there. And there is the relative displacement of, uh, of um, all kinds of installation. And here is how I was doing that. You see, you see that the actuators there with the reaction system. So all this was somehow, let's say, uh, handmade, uh, tailor-made, and I wanted to have it uh, made in a professional way. That's what, why I designed that, that system, which is now working. And I already talked about the, uh, the um, movable shaking table. This is when I was uh, trying to show in the laboratory that I could move a shaking table without any reaction. So you see this is as a simulation of that shaking table, but uh, uh, you can see here, this is a kind of uh, on-site show with, the, uh, with the, the shaking table used with a kind of a room mounted on the shaking table. This is exactly what we did uh, two days ago, but instead of having something on top of the table, there were visitors on the table uh, feeling, the, feeling the earthquake. But you can see here, we were showing what happens if there is a certain earthquake that comes to, uh, to a normal room and uh, there are no provisions to keep uh, uh, armchairs and, 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 and all this stuff uh, on, uh, you know, attached to, to the walls, even provided the walls are not collapsing. Finally, and then I stopped this, uh, recently I have, I've been looking into what's available around the world to do uh, on-site soil testing. And I realized that almost nobody has ever been able to induce liquefaction in, in soil uh, because they do not have enough power. This is one of the uh, powerful uh, tools available. This is in France, but there are also powerful ones in Austin, Texas. Uh, they are called, uh, I don't know, anyway, there are powerful machines. But what, what I've been designing is to use this movable uh, stuff, adding some mass, which, is, which can be just created with concrete, and, and using the truck itself as the reaction mass. And uh, uh, what, when I compare what, what I could uh, obtain in terms of velocity displacement acceleration with what's available today, what's available today is this one here, and, and this is what I could, I could do. And actually, when I've been uh, explaining this to my colleagues uh, who are working in geotechnical engineering, they did some calculations and said, but in the, this way you are, you are taking the soil to failure. And said, okay, this is your problem, not mine. I give you, I give you the power. Then if you want to induce liquefaction, you treat the soil in the upper part to be able to transmit the waves. Otherwise, you'll never be able to do that. Okay, so this, I think I should, um, I should stop with all our activities at your center because otherwise I'll take the entire hour. Um, I could talk about, you know, this is one of our facilities for students uh, where students are living. They are quite happy. Also, our visitors are staying in this kind of things. This is a, a 16th century uh, house uh, in the center of, of, of our city. And uh, I don't want to, as I was saying, spend time, but the uh, faculty is coming from all over the world, particularly from countries where uh, seismic engineering is relevant. And students are coming from all over the world, as you can see. As you can see here, we have flags. Uh, of the, of the countries that have been sending students. And uh, just to have an idea, our students are distributed, you see, in, in quite equal share between Europe, Asia, Italy, uh, Central and South America, and there is a significant fraction from, mainly from uh, North America and, uh, and, and New Zealand. <coughs> um, and uh, I think that this is a big power because the fact of having this number of uh, I motivated PhD students uh, and, 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 and master's students, we accept about 5% of the application. So if we get the wrong ones, uh, uh, it's our fault, not, not their fault. 
and uh, uh, after a while, they go uh, everywhere. So we've been following the uh, like the migration, you know, students coming from one place, coming here and then going to another place, sometimes going back. But you see, we have an interesting uh, shape of of, uh, of students that after studying go to other to other areas, and therefore maybe we are also acting as a, as a tool to increase uh, uh, the relations between between different uh, different countries. Okay, so this uh, um, I stop here. Uh, if uh, you have uh, any any curiosity that you want uh, to um, to satisfy now about this. Uh, the subject, please, because then I completely change and I talk about science. Mm. Yeah. So. But it was also <coughs> very interesting just for the auditorium to see what are the activities of your really very, very known uh, facilities in Pavia, okay. particularly because most of them you invented somehow. In yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. So, but if there is any question, particularly uh, not from uh, all the all the old professors like the Professor Gareth, the young guys, any curiosity? No, go ahead. So now I come to this was easy because this was something that you know there were clips and so on. But now I will I will talk about the things that are more uh, demanding. And uh, when I was uh, <coughs> discussing with. Uh, with Professor Gareski, I was proposing that I was somehow uh, revisiting uh, a lecture I gave uh, a month ago, approximately one and a half month ago, for the European Conference uh, in Engineering in Thessaloniki. So I'm not so far away from here. Uh, maybe some of you were there. I don't know. Any one of you was there at the European Conference? You were there. So you already listened to my uh, to my talk. Maybe no. You were there. So you maybe have not interested if you don't want to stay. Anyway, I, 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 I'd like to, uh, probably I will not be able to go through the entire presentation because I have only another half an hour. But uh, I have uh, uh, been putting a lot of uh, my time on uh, rethinking the entire process of uh, the definition of seismic demand and of how to face the seismic demand. And, uh, I would like, therefore, to put some emphasis on the first part, which is easier to be followed because uh, is uh, also an historical revisitation of what our, our ancestors have been uh, thinking in the past. So, first, uh, the first subject I would like to briefly <coughs> touch is the concept of elastic response spectrum. I imagine that everybody here knows about what a response spectrum is. Well, with some exception, you don't know what this is a response no. spectrum. Okay, but, but the students probably probably know. The, uh, the concept of response spectrum, anyway, is defined in red there, is uh, an attempt to uh, have an evaluation of the peak value of a response parameter. A response parameter could be acceleration, could be displacement, could be velocity, could be energy, could be anything, but you do not want to look for the entire history of this parameter during the response, but only to know the maximum value, which is the one that may have a responsibility in a collapse or in the level of damage and so on. And this is a very clever way of thinking because uh, it simplifies a lot a complex matter. And this started in, in, the, in the 20s. Uh, the first one, to the best that I know, that, that started uh, talking about the response spectrum was a Japanese, was a Suahiro, uh, and, and he actually built a mechanical system to, to get uh, the, this peak response. He was using a number of, uh, of, uh, of uh, different uh, simple degree, single degree of freedom structures with different period of vibration and tracing the response. Tracing the response is easy. You, know, you, you can simply put something that writes and something that stays and there's something where you see what the maximum value is. And, and he was recording that it, depending on the period of vibration of the structure, you have a different maximum response in terms of different parameters. But of course, after this, the uh, golden age of uh, response spectrum was uh, slightly later. Uh, you may remember, and I will talk soon about what happened in the 30s and up to 1940, 1933, in Los Angeles there was the first earthquake that was recorded with, with, a, with a strong motion uh, instrument. In 1940 there was the central earthquake that became the paradigm of, of all uh, strong motion uh, responses. So the idea is simple. The idea was uh, to say that you have a certain number of masses in a building, 
Each one of these masses uh, will go through experimenting a certain value of acceleration during the response. So essentially using uh, the basic law that were stated by Newton and by Hooke. So the basic law means that mass time acceleration is a force. Or if you want, that force uh, is uh, proportional to acceleration according to a certain uh, constant, which, by the way, is the mass of the system. So you can write that the total shear, the total force, is the sum of each mass multiplied by its own acceleration. And you can write, this is the value of the force here. Unfortunately, at that time, you didn't have any mean to uh, state what the value was of the accelerations. And you know, I'm, I'm open parenthesis, but you know how uh, before starting recording, what was the most intelligent attempt to solve this problem? Well, it was after the Messina earthquake, uh, December 31st, uh, 1908, when they, uh, the scientists had a large number of buildings available. Some of them, many of them collapsed. Many of them did not. They knew the building. So they thought that they might have been able to evaluate the strength of the building, their shear capacity. And then they were saying, OK, we know the shear capacity. We know the mass of the building. If we take this and we divide the shear capacity, we divide it by the mass, we have an estimate of the acceleration. And since they had many buildings that collapsed and many buildings that did not collapse, they started uh, trying to define level of acceleration that must have been surpassed to, to have the building collapsed. And other that could not have been surpassed because other buildings did not collapse. So they, are, they, are going, they were going through some back analysis to break the level of acceleration that the, they might have experienced to have those buildings collapsed and those other buildings not collapsed. Very clever. Anyway, the other point is here. So this is, this is Newton, Isaac Newton, and this is his enemy, Robert Hooke. Uh, Robert Hooke was simply stating that there is proportionality between force and displacement. So, this is the other constant, is stiffness. So, stiffness times displacement is a force. Mass times acceleration is a force. And this is again Newton, equilibrium. This force might, must equal this force. So, this is all the concept of spectrum is here. So, it's the fact that mass times acceleration <coughs> must be equal to stiffness times displacement. There is an absent uh, person here, uh, an absent character. This is dissipation. But dissipation was always used at that time to correct the shape of the, of the spectrum. So if the structure was dissipating more, the spectrum was shrinking. If the structure was dissipating less, the, the spectrum was going down. So it was this equation with some correction factor, which was proportional to the dissipation capacity. So I could go ahead, and, and they, actually, this is a retreatment you see mass time acceleration, what was written there, it means that acceleration divided by displacement must be stiffness divided by mass, and you go ahead with this, and you finally come out with something like this. And these are the original sketches by George Ausner. Uh, George Ausner uh, is another, uh, I'm talking to students now, is another incredible person. He was uh, uh, a PhD student at Caltech in 1940, when the, when the uh, a central earthquake was recorded. He uh, wrote very clever and intelligent material at that time, 1940. In 1989, he was a uh, professor at Illinois, and he was appointed by uh, John the Cumation, who was the, uh, pre the um, governor of California. You know, in 89, you remember, there was the Loma Prieta earthquake, and uh, uh, George, Ausner, George Ausner was nominated chairman of the commission who was in charge of uh, reporting about the earthquake. And it came out an, an incredible book that you should all read, students. Uh, this book is called Competing Against Time. And uh, it's interesting because uh, uh, in that book, George Asner is uh, stating that he's only uh, working properly in peaceful time that you can avoid transformation of an earthquake into a disaster. So there is the famous sentence, something like, uh, another uh, strong earthquake will come. We will not be able to do business as usual. It's uh, our duty to work now to avoid to transform this earthquake into a disaster. Anyway, this is George Asner. This is uh, the first uh, shape of recorded spectral shape. 
uh, displacement, acceleration. They are so similar to what is, is, is familiar to those who have been studying a little bit of earthquake engineering. So the displacement spectrum grows up almost linearly, the acceleration spectrum comes down like that. But this was a very small earthquake. This was 1933 Los Angeles. A few years later, there was the uh, response spectra uh, obtained from the El Centro earthquake. These are actually the, uh, one of the most famous uh, original uh, recording of the, of the response spectra of, of El Centro. And, and what happened is that El Centro became the paradigm of strong motion records. I was a student in the 70s and El Centro in the 70s, so almost 40 years ago, 70s and 80s. So 40 years later, El Centro was the reference earthquake. So the big ground acceleration, 0.35 G. Is that right? This was the, no discussion about that, and so on and so forth. So many people, starting from those who were working at Caltech in the 60s, and in the, in the 30s, and going to those who were working in Illinois in the 60s, uh, with, uh, with uh, Nathan Newmark, for example, and came out with, uh, with a theory. And this theory was that you could have some design spectrum, and this is the kind of design spectrum they were coming out, but it's better to look at this. What you can see here is that there were uh, somehow, I mean, the theory, that if you want to use a lower probability spectral shape, so what was called the one sigma lower probability, so with a, with a lower probability of, of exceedance, you could use a, a acceleration of 0.5 times g at the ground, and a certain amplification factor to go to 1.35 g at the mass. So these were the values, and that's the shape. But there is uh, all this, which was very smart, and actually uh, we were using this, uh, what was called a three-partite logarithmic paper, uh, to have on the same plot be able to read everything, acceleration, displacement, velocity, I have no time to discuss these kind of things now. Today you will probably use this kind of representation, and that's an acceleration spectrum, this is a displacement spectrum, this is, is, is what is more interesting for me today, and this is, uh, this is a combined acceleration displacement spectrum, and uh, this is very interesting because it's what we used uh, when we want to do some sort of uh, response spectrum analysis. Because here, this is a force and this is, an ac and this is a displacement. Therefore, in here, you can have the plot of the response of your structure. But if you look at this plot, there is something that at a certain stage of my thinking bothered me a little bit. And this point is that if you imagine that this period is maybe 0.5 G, 0.6 G, something like that. This period is maybe three or four seconds. 90% of the structure are falling in this branch here. Not here, not here, in this branch here. And in this branch here, there is something strange because all those people, finally Numark if you want, were assuming to have constant acceleration and low period of vibration, constant displacement at long period of vibration, and it was so fancy, constant velocity in between. But there is no physical reason to have a constant velocity. It's just elegant. It's just because you have constant acceleration and constant displacement, and, the, and velocity is, is the, the derivative of displacement and the integral of acceleration. But uh, anyone here, give me one reason to state to state conceptually that there must be some constant velocity. I don't think that there is any constant velocity, and I skip immediately, I go to this. So, this is constant velocity. Why should not be like this? Or in any other shape in between, or whatever. And from the point of view of structure response, the response is very different, because in one case, you end up with something like this, in terms of displacement and acceleration, but with the same kind of earthquake, if you go up there, you have a completely different level of displacement and acceleration demand. And if you look at that shape that looks so different in this kind of representation, and you go back to the logarithmic representation of Numar, you end up with a difference which is like that. Because this is a logarithmic paper, so it's represented in a different way. And if you look at the central responses that are there, depending on the kind of elaboration you want to use, are you so sure that you could say that it is one way or not the other? 
Now, what is very strange is that today we can have thousands, many thousands of uh, strong motion records to elaborate. And uh, before I start discussing this, I have not ever heard anyone questioning the fact that there must be a constant velocity region in between those two regions. So I started looking into these kind of things, and I, I skip a bit these kind of things, but you can see comparison of this. And I start looking into this, why we should believe, like in God, in, in constant velocity. And, and there is one more point. Anybody here who has been looking at signals, recorded signal, signals, uh, of a certain earthquake in a certain location, and always looking at the north-south component and the east-west component. This is standard. What happens? You, you record the two components. Now you look at the two signals and you realize that one of them has uh, by far a larger acceleration, peak ground acceleration. The other one might have a much larger peak ground displacement. So how comes? What, what's the real level? Is, is the one or the other? And I think that if you think in terms of spectrum, you should not use either the east-west or the north-south, but you should use a combined signal. You do not care about the direction. You want to know instant by instant to the maximum velocity and maximum, and maximum displacement, which is not the envelope of the two spectral shapes. It's another spectral shape. And some of the plots that you saw in the previous slides are exactly that. So it's I take the north-south, take the east-west, combine them, so I have one single signal where I don't care about the orientation, and then I take the spectrum of that signal. So uh, I'm not using the envelope, I'm not using uh, uh, the square root of the sum of the square, I'm using a rotating signal. Okay, let's go ahead another step, what they were doing in, in the 60s and, and, and earlier they were already trying to have some non-linear spectrum. What does it mean? Well, they are doing something like this. So, this again is an original sketch of that time. They were saying, I have a certain inelastic acceleration spectrum, a certain inelastic displacement spectrum. They are both function of the single, let me see if I can, okay. okay. This one, the solid line, is the, is the elastic spectrum. And then we are correcting the elastic spectrum, reducing it by the ductility factor in uh, low frequency, long period. And then we are correcting on, in the opposite direction the other spectrum, obtaining two different spectra. Whoever has been studying at my time were familiar with these kind of things. But again, is this something that we should still use today? Very smart to that side, very smart. But should, should we still use today? And where does it appear, the dissipation capacity of the structure? If you look at some more modern approach, for example, in one of the books that uh, Michael Gareski was mentioning earlier, there are some correction factor to take into account the energy dissipation. And this correction factor is uh, providing a displacement reduction factor as a function of energy dissipation. But if you look at uh, the different uh, kind of equations suggested, you will realize that the displacement reduction factor in most cases is between 0.6 plus minus 10%. So, okay, we can have refined solution. But we are making so many mistakes when 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 we are when we are uh, doing uh, uh, when we are designing a structure, and I don't think that any one of you will be worried with a ten percent uh, mistake in the correction factor. So why to go into this refinement when we can simply state let's use 0 0.6 or something in that range? If you do that, okay, you can do something like this: take the acceleration-based uh, elastic spectrum actually the combined one. If you want to reduce it according to the old uh, reduction, you come here to have the acceleration spectrum. You go up there to have the displacement spectrum. Then if you uh, decide to design for acceleration, you enter here and you read the acceleration on the vertical axis. If you want to design for displacement, you go up there and you read the displacement in the horizontal axis. This is just uh, the standard 
process, just uh, expressed in a different way of elastic, corrected design. If you want to, um, to imagine a structure response, it could be like this yellow line. So you have this level of acceleration and this level of displacement with a certain level of dot t. So this yellow representation is a structure that is compatible with this, with this response. Now imagine to go to displacement based on linear design. You have your, your uh, spectrum like this. You correct it. I will discuss uh, later on uh, why I put uh, there two different corrections. Probably I will stop with that. I don't know. Because I have 10 more minutes. And uh, either you, you use this or this. I'll discuss it later. But then you enter with a certain design displacement you want to use. You read the design displacement. You read the acceleration uh, there. And you have a curve of this sort like the green one that you see here. Now imagine that uh, you may um, question the fact that you are coming down in this way. In the previous case, nothing changes because you are staying up in the, in the top part. But in this case, what happens is that you have the, this is the yellow line in the first block. This is the green line in the second one. So you are designing something like this in force based. You are designing something like this in displacement based. But now if I change the spectral shape, it means that displacement base will go up like that, and force base will not change. So what I'm trying to tell you is that we are playing a lot. We are, if I, often I've been telling people, tell me the results you want, I'll justify it. I'll, I'll give you full justification. Tell me what, if you want this displacement, fine, I'll find a way. All you want is acceleration, so we are playing. And, uh, and, uh, um, Okay, let's skip about the correction factor. Uh, but let me now try to discuss briefly why I was saying that there are two different ways of, of correcting. And let me say that I think that I and other, others may have induced uh, in, dif in, a, in a wrong way of thinking some people. So, consider different level of combined spectrum for a different dissipation capacity. So this is, you see there, is a, is a percentage of critical uh, damping. So you come down. For some of you, this is familiar, not for all of you, I know. Anyway, for those who are not familiar, just enjoy my presentation in word meaning. So, so why, why are you keeping this point on a constant period and those points on a constant period? Is this rational or not? So, students uh, who have been facing earthquake engineering, is this rational or not? Give me an answer. Okay, I'll ask. You, I'll, I'll, I'll put it in a different way. This is the five percent that uh, displays the spectrum. And your, my question is: You have this point here. Now, if you are correcting this displacement spectrum to take into account the fact that instead of having five percent damping, you have twenty or thirty percent damping, where? That point will go. Okay, I'll tell you that all people that I know, including my students, so it's also my fault, will say that this will go here, and this is the correct spectrum. Right? Okay. So what you are doing is that you are reducing the displacement, you are conserving the period, and your acceleration, consequently, is reducing according to this equation, which is the standard equation between acceleration and displacement. Okay? Okay, so it means that if you have a response like this, this is a pushover curve, you have a certain dissipation. So, you know that dissipation means that you have a fat cycle. You are dissipating energy. You have a certain dissipation. And then you have this point, which is the capacity of the structure. And because of, this is the demand that goes there, because of damping, are you moving this point here? which means conserving the period, reducing the displacement, which is exactly what I was showing, or you will rather move it here, which is reducing displacement but conserving the acceleration. Are you conserving the acceleration or you are conserving the period? You cannot conserve both. My answer is simple. This is correct. The red one was wrong. If you do that, it means that you are not moving this point there 
which means conserving the period. But you should move that point there, which is conserving the acceleration. You understand what I'm saying? So the reduction will not go down here. We'll only move there. This point will not go down here. We'll only move here. So you see the corrected spectrum is quite different. But uh, I leave this with, uh, with, uh, with you in your mind. I think that I've not yet published this anywhere, so you can publish it. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so, but you understand what I mean. This could be, this could make a difference. We, we, are, we are interpreting in, in, a, in, a, in an appropriate way the power of dissipation in reducing the, the response of structure. So, uh, the last five minutes, um, what I did recently, but now I'm doing it on a much, much larger scale, I've been taking a number, actually, I've been doing nothing. My, my students, my guys, <laughs> my postdoc, have been taking and are taking a large number of, uh, of, uh, of recorded accelerograms. And essentially, first, first, at first looking at magnitude and distance, two parameters, now we are including uh, all soil kind and looking at several thousands of these uh, this signals. Uh, these are just the signals at the beginning Italian, then now is uh, worldwide. And we have a number of signals at different intervals of magnitude and the different intervals of distance. And we have been starting looking at equations, uh, obtaining the rotating signals, and looking what is the period of vibration uh, that is defining the two points that are defining the shape, and constructing uh, equations like this for the two points in in the two period for maximum force, maximum displacement, and then going, uh, okay, this is the same for PD, doesn't make any difference. So interpolating signals, and these are more complex equations for spectral displacement and spectral acceleration. And creating equations, I, I don't want to make it too, too cumbersome now, and uh, so we define a number of parameters. So. What comes out, for example, is that 0.46 seconds is a good guess of the period of vibration of the maximum spectral acceleration. And 2.27, this is for firm ground. We were using only signals from firm ground. And 2.2, uh, and, and uh, signals with magnitude between 4.5 and 6.5, and distances between 0 to 7 kilometers. And we have been defining all this, and you know what we have been producing? Okay, something where now this point is defined, either mean or one sigma, that point is defined, either mean or one sigma, and then we produced an equation to try to guess the intermediate shape. You remember straight line or constant velocity or something else? And this I had, I had some night of fun to invent an equation that was able to, to take all these different shapes and uh, again, I don't have time to discuss this, but it came to my mind, that's exactly the problem that we are using when we uh, use dampers. Uh, because when we use dampers, we want to be able to change this shape of the dissipated energy, and, uh, and therefore, and, and that shape, uh, which is uh, force over C versus velocity. And I realized that this is essentially uh, a property related to the fact that we are using the, deriva the second derivative of the displacement versus time equal to the derivative of displacement versus time with an exponent. And depending only on this alpha, you can create any shape you want with only one parameter. And then you go for a change of coordinates and with one single, one single parameter, you can produce any shape. And this is never constant velocity. Never constant velocity. Because if you use constant velocity, you start from a point, you only go to only one point. But what I want to do is to fix two points and to have any shape in between. So this is exactly what we did. And, and uh, OK, you, you can see that. This is very different when you look at spectral acceleration, spectral displacement. But when if you look at, at, uh, at different uh, ways of depicting, they are not so different. They don't look, you see, could you, could you say from a comparison with experimental data which one of these three plots is, is, is correct? Or when you have something like this in terms of velocity, or when you have something like, uh, sorry, in terms of displacement, or when you have something like this in terms of velocity. So we, we end up with, uh, with values for this factor also. 
And finally, we have, we've been producing completely new families of uh, spectral shapes. So now, according to this, uh, to this logic, give me distance and magnitude, and I give you the spectral shape. And, and now we are, we are going ahead with, uh, with, um, with uh, different soils, uh, and so on and so forth, and there are several people working on this. Now, uh, I, I stop here because it's, uh, it's 10 o'clock. Uh, because uh, otherwise it's another half an hour because it's the discussion on how to deal with the design of structure. And I only say a few words, the, the concept only. The logic that I'm trying to provide for, this, for design of structure is to say, okay, let's discuss which parameter I want to minimize, I want to consider fundamental for design. Is that I want to use the force, I want to use the displacement. What, what I'm trying to suggest is I want to use what is called EL, expected annual loss. I want to minimize the losses. I don't care about displacement per se or acceleration per se. I care about losses. So what I want to do is to say if I have a frequent earthquake which is producing only a fraction of losses, fraction in terms of uh, cost of reconstruction, but it comes every 30 years. This goes into an integral and builds up. If I have every 500 years an earthquake that destroys the building, I have 100% losses, the entire cost of reconstruction, but this will happen only every, 100, every 500 years, so the probability per year is low, so I have, I have uh, an integral where each part builds up. And I want to use this and to minimize the parameters to reduce the total loss. This has already, I have already published papers on this very recently. Actually, no, this one has not yet come out. It's been accepted. But the other, the other two on the space spectra has already come out on the orange uh, journal, Earth Engineering Structural Dynamics. The point is that talking about losses, is easy when you are talking about structural losses is almost easy when you're dealing about no structural losses so the cost of repairing this wall the cost of substituting a window or so on it becomes much more complex when you want to include what are called indirect costs but you can you can for example what is the cost of relocating a family in another building for six months. You can calculate that. Or what is the cost of not using an airport because uh, you have uh, broken the glasses of the control tower? It happened. It happened in the SeaTac airport in between Tacoma and Seattle. There was no damage, but all the glass of the, of the, of the control tower collapsed and they closed the airport for three days to substitute those glasses. Can you imagine what's the cost of closing uh, an airport with a lot of traffic for two or three days? So, you can do these kind of things. What is more difficult is to predict what will be the down period. Because uh, when you're trying to predict the down period, there are factors that you can control. For example, how much time you need to repair something. And there are factors that you cannot control. You know which factor is not controllable? The factor related to politics. The factor related to bureaucracy, the how many days they will take to give you a permission, and these sort of things. Anyway, this is just a, a long story made short, and uh, uh, is uh, is exactly ten o'clock, so I stop here. If there are questions, uh, I'm not in a hurry, so we can continue on as long as you wish. Thank you, Thank you very much, Professor Kali, for your very interesting presentation. Thank you. You want to use the microphone or? No. Uh, I think uh, it will be enough for everyone. Uh, I have a philosophical uh, question because our years, our age is similar. So, <laughs> so we can discuss uh, that aspect. Uh, during uh, all my career, probably years, we are, we are uh, watching development of words, development of approaches based on spectrum approaches. And uh, we all agree that these improvements and progress 
is valuable and important. But my, my question is today, what is your personal feeling for the future? Do you think still design process in this planet will be based on simplified analysis, which, which is really not so simplified, or it will be changed in, and to go in, in another direction, especially uh, regarding your <coughs> last uh, conclusion, uh, considering the co repair cost, cumulative cost uh, for uh, earthquakes uh, with low intensity, extreme earthquakes, and so on. Do you think there is some philosophical issue for the future regarding my, my Okay, I, um, I'll take this opportunity to take uh, my, my last slide. Um, so this was the, this, can you hear me if I don't use the microphone? Yeah, yeah. So this was the last slide I would be using if I should have been going to the end of the presentation. So I was going back to the central ground motion and asking how comes that out of the central ground motion they were able to take out something that has been used for half of the century, essentially unmodified. It's just that we were so lucky, or they were so lucky that there was this unicorn, you know, the right earthquake came out, which was representing the entire family of earthquake. Well, my answer is that it was rather the opportunity for intelligent people to justify the theories that were already in their mind. And that's, uh, I, I want to go to this because this is my answer to your question. Thank I you. think that we need, we will always need to use simplified approaches to understand the reference of that. <coughs> In these days, I am devoting uh, a lot of my time and uh, some six, seven of my younger uh, people to try to understand what happened in the uh, bridge that collapsed in Genova. And uh, some of my people are using extremely complex tools. One of them is making a model with a, with a software which is called extreme loading. The, uh, just the license for one year costs 50,000 euros. Okay. So you can imagine the complexity yes. of the software. And I'm happy that they do that, but they will have to reproduce what I think should have been happened, thinking in simple terms. So what I'm trying to say is that we will certainly have uh, a continuously increased capacity of modeling the reality, but uh, when you are modeling something, uh, for example, considering a nonlinear time history integration, you are only using one single, one single signal. This is not what you need. You want to do something different. You want to have an understanding of what could happen. So later on, yes, you could use this kind of things, but I have no doubt that we will uh, always need uh, uh, <coughs> tools that are based on, uh, on uh, intelligent simplifications. Intelligent simplification will also be needed, uh, for example, today uh, there is a lot of attention to monitoring, to using uh, a large number of instruments. But how many and where? If you talk to someone, they will tell you to put as many instruments as you can. I believe that this is uh, a stupid way of wasting resources. You should use a limited number of instruments, try to record in only the facts that you think are of interest for, for the reference of your structure. That's, that's, that's simple, you know. If you don't understand the response of the structure, <coughs> you're just uh, wasting your time. Sorry for taking too long for a single answer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So if there is any other question, please ask. If not, once again, <coughs> Professor Calvi, Thank you very much for your perfect presentation and I am very happy for the first day of our academic year that we can go such a uh, nice and famous person. Thank you. And I'm so sorry if I have been uh, talking a different language for some of the people here. Uh -huh. So <laughs> many... <coughs> Just a little comment maybe. Yes, it was a great honor here today.
to have this presentation. On the other hand, I'm so much glad to have a lot of equations of mathematics over here. And yes, uh, for many of my colleagues right now, I'm suffering, I believe, and saying that, oh, what these scientists are so much strange, and they were always talking on the social science by now. So I'm also honored to feel this atmosphere over here. And thank you for coming and being with us. And in the, the beginning of our new academic uh, uh, year, semester, this is a very, very wonderful and great uh, presentation what we are facing at the moment. One thing only I must just ask once again for myself, that you are saying you don't believe there is no constant velocity. In terms of earthquake or what? No, no, okay. In, te in terms of the earthquake response. Uh -huh. I can give you an example that uh, constant velocity as it a, 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 must as be a value. Constant. As a value. Okay. Uh, when you are in the lab and you are using an actuator and an engineer, and you want to know when you can take a shaking table, then there is a constant velocity mm -hmm. because you can manage this. Of course, that's a constant velocity engine, but you know why? Because the capacity of your actuator depends on the flow capacity that you have. So how much oil can you move? And then you have a constant velocity region, which is the region in which your flow is governing the response of your of your actuator. But in nature, what is your constant flow? I mean, what is the max? Do you have a maximum flow for an earthquake? So you cannot model? guarantee so, this, and you cannot. So I think that constant constant velocity in the laboratory has a very clear meaning. Constant velocity in an earthquake does not have any meaning. Okay. Once again, thank you very much. It was again very much uh, wonderful. Uh, thanks to Noah. I wish I knew a little bit more, but I cannot. What probably everybody do uh, want to hear? Is there any way to get off uh, from the earthquake or to know earthquake in advance? This is another private discussion. Okay. This, uh, this, uh, Where are we going to run? say that the answer to today's video, there is no way. No way. No way. But, but, uh, we were talking a minute ago about monitoring systems. Now, let's imagine that in the near future, very near future, you know that today an accident on the road costs uh, in the range of uh, five cents. Five cents of an impact, okay? even less. Even less. So instruments cost nothing. Well, you have a, each one of you has. Uh, can you say that the one So imagine how many accelerometers we have in this room. Now imagine that we will be able to have uh, accelerometers everywhere. In this case, really everywhere. I'm saying the opposite of what I'm saying. Here. In each one of the of the frames of the windows, in each one of the of the sprinklers you have there, everywhere. And suppose we have uh, the capacity of having all these, these signals recorded sent to somewhere, somewhere in the cloud. And suppose that we have some capacity of interpreting these signals. So who can state that we will not be able in the future to understand much more about the nature of the tectonic movements? So maybe in the future there is a hope. Today there is not. So, what some people are saying, you should not believe in this case. Some I people are just claiming that there is... But if someone is, is claiming that he can predict when, where, and which magnitude, don't trust him. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Glad to be back and seeing you all guys once again. Thank you very much all. From the students of the Faculty of Art and Design. Okay. It is an original painting from my view. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. And this is a, a real part of the yes, sculpture? Yes. So you have to show me where this place is. Okay. <laughs> I think we're all set. Yeah, we're set. Thank you very much. Okay.